competency information, uh, show you a little bit of the research behind it. Um, so, uh, competency and performance. So this is the, the Lominger Group research that I mentioned earlier. So their research strongly indicates that in any given job, there's 14 to 24 competencies that are mission critical to succeed in that role. And guess what? You can't afford to be bad in any of those mission critical competencies. One of the things I strongly encourage you to do in the first 90 days of any job is get a really firm grip on what these are. Because I don't care how rigorous the interview process is or how many great questions you ask, you really won't know until you're on the job. Um, there's always a little bit of a dance there in the first 90 days between you and your boss and your peers. And, you know, they may say something's really important in the interview and you get on the job and you find out, well, yeah, but, but there's these other things that are really critical. Okay. Um, now, here's the, here's the important point. We haven't covered yet, but I want to highlight because I, I think many of you are in this group, if not all of you. And that is, I want to talk about the value of superior performers. And this is how they define a superior performer. A, 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 let's call it an all-star or a superstar. All right. think, and you can think of sports or music or theater, you know, and, and you think of the best, right? Well, what, what, is, what does that look like in the workplace? They're one standard deviation above average, okay? And they're world class at three to eight of those 14 to 24 competencies. So think about that. Are you world class right now today at three to eight of the competencies you'll need on your first job? World class means you're as, you're as good as anybody. You may not be better, but you're as good as anybody else in that job. And most of you probably aren't quite there yet, but you might be close. You might be closer than you think. Okay, one of the big ahas for me when I started working was most people don't work real hard. Most people are looking to get by, slide through the week, thinking about Friday. <laughs> True. I grew up, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't appreciate it at the time my dad was tough. Okay. He, we, we worked hard around the house. We did projects. We did this. We did that. I thought, I thought the old man was nuts. When I got in the workplace, a lot of wisdom there. Okay. Just, just showing up 40 to 50 hours a week consistently and being ready to work will put you above average. If you're really intelligent and you got a lot of drive and you can figure out what these mission critical skills are, you'll be a superior performer. It, it's not that tough. People make it tough. So what is the value? Why is this so important? Here's your general population. It's a bell curve, right? Okay. So. I guarantee you that you're all probably already somewhere between here and here, or you wouldn't be in this room. I don't, I don't know because I haven't worked with you to know if you're here. That is just, you just don't know until you work with you. I mean, I have been fooled in interviews so many times, I can't tell you. <laughs> you hire somebody and they, you know, and, they, and they start off here and then they slide. <laughs> all right. it, it takes something special to be here every day week after week after week, year after year after year, okay? Now, <clears throat> but you can see the value. So why do companies put time into leadership development? Why did your organization, why, why do they have you here? They already think that you have the potential to be here, okay? And they're trying to develop <coughs> those. I've been corrected. They're not soft skills. They're survival skills, <laughs> okay? All right? There, there's people that already think you, you're probably here if you develop the survival skills. Okay? Well, why is that important? Because guess what? You get people there, high-performing individuals, one standard above the mean, outperform average people by 148%. Think about your peers in class. What, what, you know, what's average look like when you're back in your universities, your colleges? You know, you know people are getting C's and D's and B's and they're just average. They're inconsistent. They don't show up for class. They slide by, right? You know, a lot of your friends with them. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Okay? It's all about what you want to be. If you want to be a superior performer at work, 
Okay, you got to dial in on these competencies, these mission critical survival <coughs> skills. And why is that important? And how does that help you? If you can do it and prove it, and anybody anybody in your organization has a clue, they'll recognize that you are you are one to two times more productive than your your friend the slacker two cubicles down. <laughs> I'm serious. The president of Vanderbilt University is a friend of mine. Um, he came out of the law school, and we were talking about some of these things years ago. And he said, "Oh yeah, we've got faculty like this. You know, they're just they're way up here." So we pay them one and a half to two times what we pay everybody else because they're worth it. Okay, so when you have people around you who say things to you, and I had a summer job like this once. I don't know if you ever had one of these happen, but I had people around me who were like, man, why are you working so hard? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you ever heard that one? <laughs> Guy had a job. You ever heard of uh, Hickory Farms packaging? Or Hickory Farms... Um, uh, you know, they sell the, the pre-packaged like cheese and meats and stuff at the, at the holidays. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a plant in my town where, where they assembled all that stuff in the summer. So think about that. They're assembling your Christmas gift in July. Okay. <laughs> and so then a lot of the college students would come home and we would work at the packaging plant. And it was a, it was a you know, it was an assembly line of food and cheese and all this stuff. It wasn't fancy. But it was probably one of the best work lessons I ever had because we had college students and we had people without a high school degree, okay, every race, ethnicity, background, okay. And guess what, guess what the college students heard all summer? Slow down. You're working too hard. <laughs> Why are you working so hard? We're only being, we're all being paid the same, okay. Isn't that crazy, okay. But you've, some of you nodded your head earlier when I said you've already heard that in classes or in jobs, right? It doesn't really change you to get out there in the big corporation. There will be people, and they may not come right out and say it. They're more, they're, they're more refined. They just turn stuff in late. They just call in sick. Okay? They sh you know, that's how it works in, in the corporate world. Okay? And guess what? That makes you one to two, two, maybe three times as productive as them if you don't do that stuff. It's not just intelligence. All right, so the goal of a lot of coaching, leadership development, has anybody heard of something called 360 degree feedback? Okay, what is, what is 360 feedback? That's when not only your manager is giving you feedback on the work that you're doing, there's people that's around you also giving you feedback on the work that you're doing. Right. So we put out an assessment and we say, I want everybody, I want customers, staff, peers, managers, everybody around you, 360 degrees to tell me how you're doing. Okay? And then we sit down and we talk about that and we tie it to competencies and we help you see where you can get better. Okay? And so the whole, the whole sort of research and stream of study behind this is designed to identify and develop outstanding performers. And guess what? You're already, you're already in one of those programs, so congratulations. Okay? So what are we trying to do? We're trying to take struggling to average, average to a star, star to a superstar, superstar to make you even better. So a superstar, and many of you are probably already superstars, you will come in, you will blow through the individual contributor level, you'll quickly be into a manager role of some sort, but, and this is the thing I want you to remember, but you still got something to learn. Mm -hmm. New competencies, new challenges, stuff you haven't dealt with. So just because you're a star, don't get a big head. You're a superstar, don't get too overconfident. Okay? Remember, there's always another hype. There's always a new challenge. There's always something you can prepare for. Remember I said, talk about learning agility. <clears throat> so what do you think is the engine that drives your movement? Forget competencies for a minute. We talked about that. But what's the engine that drives your movement across all this? It's that learning agility. So let me give you an example of learning agility. It's the, it's the ability to be dropped into a completely new situation and you got 90 days to figure it out and get something done. Okay. No excuses. You are expected to figure it out and get it done. And I'll give you an example. This happened to me two and a half years ago. We have some graduate programs. We, didn't, uh, we were coming through the downturn. We didn't have enough staff to support them. 
So somebody came to me and said, I think we just need to hire a vendor on a, on a very short-term basis to provide some career coaching. Jason, go make it happen. You got 90 days. You know, I've never hired a vendor. I, you know, I'm, you know, how much do we spend? I, I, I never did a contract like that, blah, blah, blah. Jason, I don't care. This is a stretch assignment. Figure it out. Okay? So what happens as you move up, they start to take the training wheels off. Okay, nobody's going to handhold you. They're not going to tell you what books to read. They're just going to give you what's called a stretch assignment. And guess what? The research shows that the learning agile, figure it out. Okay? So if I said, okay, the whole group tomorrow, you're going to, we're going down to Hartsfield, we're getting on an airplane, you're going to London. We're going to the Olympics, all right? And I want you to figure out how we're going to get a hotel and tickets, and we're going to get around, and you're in charge of the group. You got 24 hours. Go. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's extreme. But, okay, we would find out very quickly who was learning Agile and who was not. I did this to my daughters once. We were in D.C. And we'd gone around for a day, and we were, we were in a, uh, a hotel that was right on the subway system there and so one morning we get on the subway and I we had one of these brochures where we were going and a little map and I said her name is Elizabeth Lizzie I said Lizzie you're in charge today she's 13 years old <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I said hey you, you know you're gonna be okay we're gonna stay together you can ask questions I just want to see how you do you know what? She did pretty good. She got us around. She, you know, five or six hours. She was in charge. Got us around. No problem. And then she hit the wall and started crying on me. You know, <laughs> I'm tired. Oh, 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 oh. But you know what? For five or six hours, that was pretty good. I found out that she's got. She's pretty learning agile. Okay. My point is, most of you probably haven't been tested like that yet. You might. You might have, but not fully. Um, and learning agility is definitely something you can become better at. All right, but think about how would you respond and, and maybe even volunteer from, for some assignments like that early, okay, when it's not do or die. Okay, you get on the job and you see some mission critical stuff and you just, just volunteer to be part of it. Just get closer to it. See what's going on. What does it take to lead something like that? Okay. So one of the things about competencies I did want to touch on is competencies have to be behavioral based. A competency isn't just like I know it. We talked earlier about intelligence and, and sort of hard skills, right? A competency is, is really about your behavior. So we can sit here all day long and talk about dealing with ambiguity. Um, I'll give you an example. I had a boss that retired in May. They didn't name my boss until July 4th. So I didn't have a boss. Pretty ambiguous, pretty, pretty ambiguous, right? What do you do? I can't, I, I can't tell you the number of people in the college that kept coming up to me going, Jason, oh my God, who's your new boss? Oh my God, you know, what do you do? I, I, you don't have a boss. I was like, it, it'll be okay. <laughs> you know, I trust the dean. I'm gonna come in every day. Uh, I know who to go to if I got a problem. It's, it, it'll work its way out. People were having meltdowns. <laughs> Okay? Now, years ago, I would have had a meltdown. Okay? But that's something that's behavioral. So it's one thing to say I can deal with ambiguity. It's another, it's another thing to do. All right? My point is, when you get into um, developing competencies, if you get into 360-degree feedback, if you're working with a manager who espouses that they want to help you with this, make sure that they're giving you behavioral-based advice. Not something sort of up in the air, you know, pie in the sky theory. Okay, what's the behavior? What is it you want me to do differently? Because <clears throat> there's a lot of people running around doing 360 and, and competency work, and they don't know what they're doing. It's got to be about the behavior. Does that make sense? Tell me what you want me to do. Um, now, 360 feedback should only be used for your growth and development. It should not be used, and a lot of companies do this, so I'll pick on Joel for a second. Joel's been with us for two years. He's doing a, I'm just picking on him. <laughs> He's not doing real well, okay? 
But I'm kind of, I'm a chicken as a manager, and I don't really want to tell Joel because I'm a chicken because I haven't developed that competency. Okay, so what do I do? Joel, we're going to put you through some 360 degree feedback. We want to help. We want to help you. Help you. Okay. So we give them 360 feedback, and we hit them with all this stuff, and we might even use the right tools and be behavioral based. And then we sit you down, we go over it all, and we say, and in six weeks, if you don't, fi if you don't change all this, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Is that developmental? <laughs> Does that sound like I was trying to help Joel? Okay. So one thing I want a word of caution is when somebody starts talking about this, you may not have a choice um, because the organization's doing it, but ask some good questions. Is this developmental or is this a performance issue? Am I gonna have, how much time am I going to have to improve it? If somebody says six months to a year, that's developmental. Now, there still could be a performance issue that they're watching, but six months to a year, that's, that's enough time to make some improvement. Six weeks? I've already made up my mind I don't like Joel and I really like him out, and I just need some documentation to get him out. <laughs> okay? It happens every day. Okay. Accuracy of this feedback. Now, this is important, and this was a shocker to me. The, the person who's probably the most accurate source of feedback about your competency development is your boss. If you think about it, it makes sense. Why? Because your boss probably has done your job. And your boss has already made the transition from that role into the next role, and they have a pretty good idea of whether you're moving in that direction. So you want to have a good, open, candid dialogue with your boss, and you want to know what those things are that you have to develop. Where, you want, where the red flags come up is when your boss doesn't say anything, doesn't say anything, doesn't say anything, and then at, the, at performance review time after a year, they just hit you with a ton of stuff, and you feel like, well, great, why didn't you tell me that six months ago? Okay, that's a red flag. You probably have a pretty inexperienced manager who just isn't comfortable giving feedback. I'm telling you right now, as you go out and interview, you're gonna have to talk to a lot of people. Focus on the person that will be supervising you and make sure you feel comfortable working with that person and that they really want to develop you. And I'm not, they can be firm, they can be demanding. Okay, but the number one thing you need is candid, honest, regular, not daily, not weekly. But every, every month or so, you ought to have a conversation that goes beyond, hey, what'd you do this weekend? You know, it ought to be about how am I doing? How can I get better? What am I doing well? You know, I know I'm not perfect, what can I do better, right? And then the, and the feedback ought to be behavioral based. So really important to think about that, because a lot of people get caught up in, oh, the benefits are great, and they pay me a lot of money, and it's on the east side of 400 up in Alpharetta, and, you know, and the next thing you know, they're working for Attila the Hun, uh, you know, or they're working for somebody who's, you know, just incompetent, right? You want somebody who's really good at their job, it isn't their first time being a manager, um, and that they have probably more than one person reporting to them. Peers tend to be the second most accurate. So even if there's not a 360 degree feedback system in place, guess what? Talk to your boss, talk to your peers. The first, you know, 90 days to 180 days, it's important to get some regular feedback the first six months. Now this is interesting, direct reports. So if I have people reporting to me, they're actually third, but most accurate on leadership. So if my staff doesn't think I'm a very good leader, guess what, I'm probably not a very good leader. They could be dead wrong about a lot of other stuff. And this has happened to me, okay? I mean, this has happened. Uh, there, was a period, there was a period in my career where I wasn't a very good leader, okay? I had to listen. I was really good at everything else, but this was not good. I was too busy just doing my own thing. I wasn't really listening to the people. Guess what? I had to change my behavior. I mean, it was amazing. It was like, you don't listen to us, you don't talk to us, you don't da 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 Okay, fine. We'll have regular one-on-one -on -one meetings, and we'll have a weekly staff meeting, and, you know, and I started listening and actually implementing some things that they wanted, not everything. Changed in 90 days. So, I mean, to me, it was like, What's the big deal? Well, it meant, it meant everything. Okay. Um, now, this is the funniest part, and this is important. The least accurate, self-reporting. 
I think I'm wonderful. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I'm just perfect. <laughs> right, this is the value of 360. Okay, and you want you want to have your own system. You don't want to wait for the company to come up with 360. You need people that you trust to give you feedback. Okay, because you think you're wonderful, and it has absolutely no correlation to your real performance. At least that's what the research says. Um, this is interesting. <clears throat> Have everybody heard the, the term perception is reality? Yeah. Right? So, so I, um, uh, I walk right by Joel in the hallway because I'm busy thinking about uh, 8 million things. I didn't mean to ignore him, but what's the perception? Oh, man, that boss is so aloof. He never even looks at me. He's rude. I might have been walking by him thinking, oh, there's Joel. He's up for promotion. Uh, I think I'd really like to see that. <laughs> That's in my head, right? So my point is, this all this behavioral stuff is really important because that's what people use to make decisions. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you meant to say. It matters what you said and what you did. And I guarantee you, when you become a manager, this goes up. This is one of those blind spots for people. It's like, you know, you, we might all be peers and one of us gets promoted. Hoo -hoo, Joseph gets promoted. We are going to watch you like a hawk. Okay? It just, it's human nature. We're going to watch you and we're going to be looking for consistent behavior. And you know what? That's a blind spot for most people. It's like, oh, you know, I came in 10 minutes late. Why is everybody else coming in 10 minutes late? I'm the boss. Well, you did. It's okay. It must be okay. All right. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. Is uh, more for people in HR. I talked about stallers and stoppers earlier. Things that might derail you. This is a great conversation to have with a mentor. If you, if, if, as you're getting promoted, hey, I used to be really good at the details of pulling pulling numbers together for a client. Is that still important? Um, I guarantee you, in, in roles like yours, probably a mentor would say, um, no, actually, you got five people that are supposed to do that for you, and if I catch you doing that, you're doing your job wrong. Mm -hmm. Your job, you're not leading if you've got your nose down doing numbers. Whoa, okay. Got to let go of that one, right? Um, so, so dial in on this. Dial in on those things. That's important. Talked about this. Oh, this is important. <clears throat> Skills required at the next level that are moder moderately difficult to harvest to develop. You really need to develop those early. Because if, if that doesn't happen early, you're in trouble. That goes back to that learning agility thing. So one of the things you want to ask in a promotion situation or even a new job is, what are the top three things I have to nail in the first six months? What do I have to be good at? Because you can't focus on everything. Okay. Um, if you wait to develop these until after you've made the transition, you will likely, you're more likely to fail. So you can't, um, I, I always get nervous when somebody says, well, you know, I want to get in the role and talk to a lot of people and kind of size things up. What that tells me is they really probably haven't thought through this. Now, it's one thing to say, I've got a pretty good idea what needs to be done. I think these are the top three things, but before I move forward, I do want to talk with folks and get some input. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Talk about flame out factors. Um, the number one thing I'll tell you, because most of you are coming in at this individual contributor level, it, you know, and you're gonna, it's gonna drive you crazy. Some of you, you're gonna get some assignments that you think, really, can't they get, you know, isn't there somebody else that can do this basic work? <laughs> and you might get stuck doing that for a couple of years. Only thing I can tell you is suck it up and get good at it. Get really good at it. Okay, and get to the point where you are the go-to person and you know it took me it, it might take you a month to get something done the first time and now you get it done in two weeks and then you get it done in a week and the boss sees that and now I give you more 
And I'll tell you a little tip, a good uh, family member of mine told me. Because that happened to me early in my career. I was like, man, they just keep giving me more. They just keep giving me more. And he kind of smiled at me. He goes, that's what happens to good people. You know, when you're good, they just give you more. All right? And you can do that up to a point. Okay, because you get better, you get faster, you get better at using the tools or the resources around you. And then there's a point where you have to go into the boss and go, I'm not sure if you're aware, mm -hmm. but remember that remember that bell curve? You know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I'm one standard deviation above average, and I'm doing about one and a half to two times what everybody else is doing. We need to talk about a raise or a promotion. Okay. <laughs> but you got to do that. And here's another dirty little secret about the work world. Okay? You can't do that for three months and have that conversation. You got to do that for six months to a year minimum. All right? Drives me nuts when so I hire somebody and they come in in 90 days or even, frankly even six months and they're looking for a promotion. I mean, you've got to prove to me that you can do this for at least a year consistently. All right? And so one of the things I suggest is you don't have to be an all star on the first day. All right? You want to get better and better and better and be consistent and stronger and stronger and stronger. Don't come in and burn yourself out in the first 90 days. Just keep coming on strong, okay? All right, I'm going to skip out of this and show you some, uh, some more interesting things. <clears throat> now, one of the things I sent you via email before the session was uh, two, two uh, PDF documents. This comes from the Harvard Business Review. It's uh, a compilation of a number of articles on leadership development. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through the whole thing, but they picked out I don't know if this is six, eight, nine of uh, what they consider their best articles on leadership in the last decade or so. Um, I'd encourage you to read this, review it, try to tie it back to some of the things you've learned this week, some of the things we've talked about, um, and just use this as a reference point because, as we said, you know, it's really not going to be longer term. It's really not about the hard skills. It's going to come back to these things. The other reason I showed you this is I think I think HBR is a just an amazing resource. I mean, a lot of stuff on their website that you can get for free. Um, the subscription's not cheap, but I think it's worth it. Um, but if you don't want to subscribe yet, check out their website. They've got blogs and all kinds of great tools. And a lot of it's about your own career. I mean, there's always a thread in there every time they put something out about driving your own career. And, and if you, you know, one of, one of the takeaways definitely I hope you take with you it, back to our analogy of are you climbing a ladder or is it a rock climbing wall, right? I think we all agree it's more like a rock climbing wall. Here's the other thing. Who do you think is in charge of your career? I hear a lot of whispering. You are. I mean, I am. Tell you, what you are. <laughs> right. Do you, think the, do you think the company's in charge? Do you think your boss is? <coughs> maybe, maybe way back when there was a little bit more emphasis on let's identify talent and groom and develop, okay? In some of the best organizations, there's, there's still some talent management and talent development, but it doesn't usually happen until you get here or here. So guess what? For the first decade, you are in charge. I mean, it's really on your shoulders. So whatever, whatever you need to do, career-wise, you're going to have to figure it out. And, you know, that doesn't mean there aren't people to help you. It just means nobody sort of, there isn't somebody, let's say you're working in a big office building, there isn't somebody 10 floors up sitting around going, yeah, I wonder I wonder how Joel's doing. You know, maybe we need to move him over here, move him over. You, you're lucky if your boss is thinking that way a little bit. Me. Okay. Um, and again, I don't say, say that to sort of scare anybody, but I think you've just got to, you got to know what you're getting yourself into and be thinking about what those next couple moves are. All right, so that's one resource. I encourage you to check that out. Um, other one I wanted to share is uh, Corn Ferry is, is the, the parent company that bought a company called Lominger that did all that research I showed you earlier. Corn Ferry's into leadership development. They're into executive search. Um, and this is a great article on building those leadership skills that matter, those competencies. If you're really interested in this uh, topic, you know, just um, encourage you to read this. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, and there's a couple of charts in here that you might find interesting. You know, 
untapped strengths, strengths we've already lever we're leveraging, things that, that really could differentiate you that's hidden. I guarantee you that all of you have some hidden talents, hidden skills that will never come through on the resume or in the interview process. All right, what you've, one of the things you've got to do early in your career is figure out where the organization's going, what makes you different or unique, and how do you align with that? Okay, beyond that current job that you're in. So that, so that these start to come to the forefront and the people around you start to see it. Okay, so that's another resource. Let me give you a um, couple of websites. I want to show you very quickly. This is uh, a website called Job Titled. I sent you, I think I've sent you the login, uh, the link um, in, a, in that email. And Job Title is really an interesting resource. It was developed by a group of alumni from Robinson. Um, they, um, uh, they literally have scanned millions of resumes into a database. And what they did then is they took and tried to figure out what is the career path for, um, and, and not that there's one, but what are some likely paths for people all the way up to the sea level, okay? So what, what I like to do with this, for people that are sort of thinking through this career pathing, um, is challenge you to go in here and just, just do some research, okay? And so what I pulled up, um, so under Explore, you can literally search by job title, you can search by your degree, um, and I typed in actuary, and a bunch of titles came up. This is just one of them, uh, actuarial associate. But here's, here's where it gets interesting. So you've got next jobs, previous jobs, okay? Ooh, I guess we will, I guess we've been locked in. So here's, you know, here's some, here's some other jobs. And isn't this interesting? Average time in those jobs. So one of the things you can start to do, and this isn't, you know, this is really good because it's, it's data driven, but in these organizations you get in, figure out what the paths are, and there could be two or three, and then start to watch and pay attention. Well, how long do I need to be in those roles? Okay. There's some roles that are quick hits, 18, 24 months. Some roles looks like three to four years. Um, <clears throat> some of you may get started and decide, you know, I want, I want to move into something totally different. Um, and again, that's where you can come back into this resource and you could type in, oh, you can time me out. So let's say you get, you get down the road and you want to do something different. One of the things I like to do this one as an example okay one of the things I love to do with folks because a lot of people come in saying I want to be the C something right okay great you want to be you want to be the C something okay well look at the previous you know look at the previous jobs you got to be in Just stay here. So guess what? You got to be a manager, director of finance, a VP of finance, a controller, and then a CFO. Well, there's what's that? Five jobs right there. That's probably that's probably 20 years of career right there. My point is, a lot of folks will. You might hit a uh, Joshua might hit a point in his career where he's stuck. He's frustrated. Wants to do something different. He comes back to school. Um, takes an internal lateral move. Whatever the case may be. And he's saying, you know what, I want to get on this track. And frankly, a lot of people come to folks like me with very unrealistic ideas of how quickly that's going to happen. You know, I'm going to come back, get an MBA, get an advanced degree, and I'm going to skip over five levels and go right to the C-suite. <laughs> okay? Now, again, I don't say that to scare anybody, but one of the things that I think you got to do as you get out there in your career and you start really figuring out what's, what's realistic for you is 
dig into a resource like this and start to get a real idea of, okay, there's three or four different levels that I'm going to have to work through, right? And then tie all that stuff back to what are the competencies that I got to develop to do it? All right? One of the things with this, this rock climbing wall idea of your career is, <clears throat> so let me ask it, let me pose this as a question. When would it be a good idea to take a lateral move? Why might you take a lateral move on, on your own? Not because you were downsized, just, you know, you're, you're, you're planning a strategy and you take a lateral move. Why would you do that? Because um, you want to try something new, but you're not willing to, like, risk maybe some of the, um, like, the opportunity cost of moving up. You're not willing to take that. Okay, so uh, maybe, maybe you're offered a promotion to New York City and you don't, you don't really want to live in New York. Um, and it's one of those situations where you start to go, you know, I'm really happy here. That division's moving. Let me slide. Let me just yeah. take a lateral move. Okay. That's one reason. Uh, think about the competency idea and building competencies. Why might you take a lateral move? That's the answer. Say it loud for everybody they can hear. So like in the lateral move, like we don't need to take the next challenge for the competencies that we have developed. So we just go through the, the competencies that we developed at the stage. Okay, I don't, I don't think everybody heard that, so let me repeat it. So he's saying, let, I'll just give you a scenario. Let's say you're in sales and you are offered, you currently cover uh, Atlanta or Georgia and Alabama and they offer you a bigger territory with more money you got the whole southeast but your goal you're tired of sales you get it you've been salesperson of the year for the last couple of years what you're thinking about is becoming a sales manager okay and you need to develop some some other competencies so what he was saying is you know I really I'm really not interested in the money right now, yeah, I'd like to make more money. I want a different role. So I need to develop some other competencies. So you might go and take a lateral move inside or outside of your own organization to do what? To develop those competencies, right? So you might take, maybe there's an in-between role, okay? Maybe there's a role like, like um, <clears throat> in the actuarial world, maybe you have, uh, you know, you're an individual contributor, they want to just, they want to just, uh, I don't know, they want to promote you to corporate from a regional office, but you, but you want to be a manager. You know, so an intermediate role might be, you know, I, I'm not really interested in that. I want to be a project manager and own a couple of key accounts. And I think that's going to help me develop the competencies I need to then manage a team of people and cover the southeast because I want to stay on the east side of Alpharetta in Atlanta, right? Okay, again. Just, I'm just using that as an example, right? You start, you get out there in the world and you start going, yeah, I, I don't really want more of this. I, w I want to change the competency base. All right, so sometimes that lateral move, smartest thing you can ever do. I have an uncle who was at Hershey's Foods. Everybody knows Hershey's, right? Hershey's Kisses, right? He, he went to Notre Dame, got his MBA, very accounting based. Um, about four or five years into the, into the job, they opened a marketing department. Never had a marketing department at Hershey's, can you believe it? It was like 1982, 80, something like that. He took a lateral move. And I, I remember as a kid, I was 12, 13 years old. Yeah, your Uncle Ron took a lateral move into marketing. So what does that mean? Well, my dad was like, well, you know, he just, I think he just got tired of crunching numbers. Okay, great. All of a sudden, Uncle Ron's in charge of Twizzlers. Uncle Ron's in charge of Reese's. You know, every, at Christmas, we're getting all these freebies, okay? <laughs> And I guarantee you, by the time he's in charge of the Reese's brand, he's not making what he was making crunching numbers, okay? But he had to take a lateral move, develop some different competencies, and then he took off, okay? So th I think that's really important today because guess who's going to have to make that decision? You, right? Nobody's going to, I mean, people actually are going to offer you some things that you probably should turn down. And they're going to go, why did he turn that down? Well, it didn't fit your plan. 
Okay. All right. Last resource is Vault. I don't know if you've heard of, heard of Vault, sometimes called Career Insider. Great research guide. So when you get into uh, researching specific companies, let's pick one out. Who, what's a company that y'all might go to work for? Big All company. State. All state. All state. Okay. Oh, my goodness. sorry. I had these all queued up earlier. I'll tell you a million dollar idea. Figure out how to get rid of all these passwords. Mm -hmm. um, let me try one more time. So, what do you think the number one piece of feedback is we get from companies who interview our students? And this isn't just Georgia State students but college students in general about the interview process and where you could do better. What do you think they tell us? They, you know, somebody interviews hundreds of college students and I say, what can college students do better today? What are you regularly disappointed with? They don't know enough about the company. No company research. And here's why it drives all of us old gray hairs crazy. <laughs> Because when I started interviewing for jobs, it was before the internet. Yeah. Okay? So here's what drives us nuts, is you, you today have access to this stuff at your fingertips. Even if you don't have login to Vault, you can go on Google and get a bunch of information in seconds. Okay? I used to go to the library and look it up on microfiche. Anybody even remember microfiche here? No. Thank God, it was painful. Okay? My point is, the people who are interviewing you and hiring you feel like there's no excuse, zero, to not have a really good understanding of the company, products, services, competitors, current events. All right, you need, you need that. You need a one-page outline memorized and some really good questions to ask that are related to that job. If you do that, remember that chart? That puts you in the superior performer category instantly. I mean, nobody does this, and it drives us all crazy because guess what? Yeah, I had to log in a couple of times, but it's right here. So here's Allstate. Uppers, downers, up, you know, summary. They even survey people. All right, you, ha you have external reviews. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's right here. Now, here's the other part I wanted to show you, though. You've got industries. So let's say you're thinking about changing industry. You can, you, can, you can research the industry. Specific professions, okay? There's so much information at your fingertips today. That's not the problem. Let me tell you what the problem is. Nobody has a strategy. So if you, if you walk out of here with one thing, my challenge to you is to develop a plan and a strategy that's proactive where you're, maybe not daily, but in the first couple of years of your career, once a month, could be on your lunch hour. Think about your career plan. What are you doing to advance your plan? What are you doing to build your network? What are you doing to, to identify mentors? Okay, at least once a month. Keep, keep your LinkedIn profile up to date. Keep your resume up to date a couple times a year, quarterly, okay? Because it's on you, all right? Nobody's gonna do this stuff for you and when opportunities present, you wanna be ready. Okay, it is 10 minutes to two. Let me just pause there. I see everybody nodding off. We're getting that post-lunch coma. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a lot of information. Um, let me give you all a chance to ask some questions about anything. Um, and I don't say this to brag, but I've done this stuff for 20 years, and 
you know, anything you want to talk about related to jobs and careers, I probably know something. <laughs> so fire away. Anything you're nervous about, you're concerned about, whatever. Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier about how there were some individuals who were type of farmers and some who were average and some who were below average. I was wondering in today's content with the economy the way it is with everyone looking for employment. If sorry. I'm a, if, I'm a, if individuals uh, <laughs> sorry. I need to turn the volume off. Go ahead. If individuals still do that. I mean if if the how do individuals still do what? Get away with it being not as highly productive as it could be. Man, there's so many. Oh, how do they get away with it? Yes. Ah, called organizational inertia. Have um, you ever been on a sports team? Pardon? Ever been on an athletic team, or um, yeah. you ever been in what? Uh, what do you do extracurricular? Music, art, uh, honor society. So say that again. Honor society. Honor society. NSCS. Okay. So have you ever been in an honor society? And you look around in a meeting and you realize there's only six of you who do the work. <laughs> yes. Okay? That's everywhere. Okay, so it's called the 80-20 rule. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Okay? And the problem is you can't fire everybody. Okay? So you, you've got to have people around to do something. Okay? And frankly, most companies are not good at weeding out low performers. Okay, now, I'd say they're, they're better at it than they used to be, and the way they do it is through the downsizings quite often. Every couple of years, big companies will downsize. Let me tell you what's really going on there. You know, we just added 10,000 people over the last five years. Uh, we, see, we see a little bit of a dip in the economy. We're gonna let, we're gonna let 2,000 people go. Some of those people, a lot of them, are just low performers. So they get rid of them that way. But what happened during, during those five years? You had a lot of low performers on the team. Okay, that's that inertia. We get going, we get busy. We don't want to, you know, I, I, I'm working with Joel, I'm working with him, I keep meeting with him, he's not improving. I keep picking on you, go ahead. Okay, he's not improving. And then, guess what? My boss comes to me and says, hey, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a reduction in force. We're gonna lay some people off. Who do you want to lay off? Joel. He's gone. Okay. But everybody in my unit has known for three years that Joel's a, a, a poor performer, and they're all going, why didn't you get rid of him sooner? The reality is pe most managers, re I mean, we're all human. I, I had to do this once. We had to let somebody go. It is not fun to sit across the table from somebody and go, you're going home today and you're never coming back. I mean, that's not what I said. But <laughs> we have a nice script from in charge. It sounds very pleasant, but it's, you know, the, me the message is, is the same. I mean, that is just no, but I don't care how tough you think you are, that is not fun. Even if they deserve it, it is not fun. Okay? Does anybody know General Electric? Jack Welch? What was one of the things he was famous for? When it comes to the rating system, right. What was it? What was the system? You remember? A, B, C players, right? So his, their theory, they believe in something called differentiation, which meant we are going to put our staff on a bell curve, and we're going to tell every year at performance review time, and you're going to know, Joshua's going to know if he's an A, B, or a C player. And if he's a C player, he's going to be put on a short timeline with a lot of feedback to turn it around, or he's out. Okay? And they and, and GE was pretty was pretty good at that in terms of moving moving the low performers out. Do you think they were perfect? I know they weren't perfect. I know people who worked at GE during that during that time. You know what they told me? Well, there was a lot of ways to game the system. Okay? Why does that happen? Because we're human. You know? I, yeah, he's a good guy. She's great. Her husband just passed away. I don't wanna, you know, we don't want to them out. All right. So I mean it's a big answer to a very simple question. How does that happen? How do low performers stay around? The other reason low performers stay around is there's two other big reasons. We hire the wrong people for the wrong job, right? That's a misfit and then we kind of struggle to figure that out. Or 
we promote people and they don't have that learning agility and they're in over their head and they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to figure that out. Okay? So, so si large organ any organization is not perfect. Okay? There, it takes time and you're always going to have you're always going to have average or below average performers. The, the question is how quickly and effectively do you deal with them? You get feedback to them, do you try to help them, do you try to support them, and if they can't, you move them out. Que other questions? Any, anything on these topics? Yes? Um, let's say like, that for some reason you do understand that your learning agility is not as great as others do. Like, is just learning ahead of time, like trying to learn those competencies before time, is that the only really effective yeah. way to... A absolutely. So, so, you know, you know, man, I am not the most learning agile person. You know, I have to read things three and four times um, to get it. So, DeMar just came up with a great idea. Guess what? Plan ahead. You know, you, you know you're getting a new job. You know it's coming or you think it's coming. You start reading and preparing and developing early. You know, you may just you may just have to put in more time. I had a, I have a cousin. My dad used to say he never had to crack a book. He was just smart, right? He just literally didn't even have to look at the books. Me, I mean, I had to buy them. I had to read them. I had to reread them. I had to outline them. I mean, it was more sweat than intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that book smart back then? Um, my 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 point is what he's talking about is adaptation. Know yourself. It's all about how badly you want. I mean, have you ever wanted something so bad that you just, you know, you just went above and beyond to get it? I'm sure you did. You wouldn't be in this room. Okay? So absolutely, that's what you do. Other questions? Other questions on anything related to career? Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, okay, when you go into the job site or whatever, as an, as an entry level, and people have different personalities, these people who are shy, do you think in corporate America, especially, shyness brings more negative to? Great question. Um, so, if you've ever has anybody here taken the Myers Briggs um, type indicator assessment, yeah. you, you find one of the things you find out is if you're extroverted or introverted. Mm -hmm. Introverts sometimes are referred to as shy. Introverts tend to like to work in quiet space, and you know when they when they need to recharge their batteries, they don't go to a party. They go, and, they go and read a book or do something quiet, okay? And they often, introverts often really struggle with a lot of noise and a lot of people and a lot of interaction, okay? There's some, not, not all, but typically, if you describe yourself as shy, you're probably introverted. Couple things to know. Number one, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a spectrum. So on one end, you could be extremely extroverted. On the other end, you could be extremely introverted. Most people over time sort of move to the middle. I used to be extremely extroverted. When I first started taking that assessment 20 years ago, I'm kind of moving, I'm kind of drifting to the middle. I need a little quiet time once in a while now, right? Um, so it's not like you're permanently fixed, but if you are at one end or the other, you're not going to flip-flop and go all the way to the other side. It's just, mm -hmm. it's sort of, it's a little bit like a thumbprint. I mean, it's, it's who you are, okay? However, it's really important to know thyself and know, okay, I'm introverted. Maybe in that entry level job, if I'm in a cubicle or an office and I'm doing spreadsheets all day, it's not an issue because I don't have to interact with a lot of people. I can kind of do what I need to do. Promotion time comes and I've got to interact with more people. Now I've got to think about, okay, it may be, I may be out of my comfort zone, but I'm going to have to work at being more, um, less shy, you know, more interactive. And I'll give you an example. There's a person we work with um, who, who's definitely introverted, and, and he and I have talked about this, and recently moved into a, a management role, and I said, to, I said to him, I said, look, I'm not trying to radically change who you are, but there's like two or three little things that could change people's perception. And one of them was, I said, the first hour of the day, do not come in, ignore everybody, shut your door and go to work. Come in. Spend 20 minutes, just go around, chit chat with folks, say hi, then go in your office. Totally change people's perception. Oh man, this person's really interactive. You know, they came and talked to me. Yeah, you know, he's still introverted. It's just not, 
you know, it's just he's doing some things intentionally to, to interact with people. Now, you talked about sort of getting over being shy. There's other things you can do. Have you ever, anybody heard of Toastmasters? Yeah. Okay, Toastmasters is a wonderful organization that if you are in a role where you're going to have to get up and speak like this or do introductions, um, they have a series of meetings that you go to and you get to actually practice all kinds of different kinds of public speaking. And you do it with people who are all kind of in the same boat and you, you encourage each other so it's a positive experience. So again, you, let's say you're an introvert, you're kind of a shy person, but you really want this job where you know you got to do some public speaking. Well, uh, back to the point we were making earlier. Do something about it, right? In advance, get yourself ready. Join Toastmasters. Uh, the one thing I do, I do sort of feel for, for introverts is when you look at the, the population, 70, 80% of people are extroverted. So introverts sometimes feel a little bit like, boy, I'm different, you know, and I don't fit in with this group. So I do think, unfortunately, it's the way it is. Uh, business tends to favor extroverts, generally, and if you're introverted, you just need to be aware of that and, and try to work against that a little bit, right, and try to develop those skills and know when to use them. Uh, an example, I read a book about a woman who, who do, believe it or not, does public speaking for a living. And she said, you know, I just, had to, I just had to realize that when I was done with my speech, I didn't need to go to the, to the networking reception afterwards because I was exhausted. Just getting that speech done, the next thing I needed to do was go to my hotel room and rest for an hour. Then I could go back out to dinner and interact with clients. So that's just self-knowledge, self-management. But that's a, that is a great question. Um, I'll take one, one more question, and, uh, um, and then I've got one, one last thought to share with you. Yes? Can I find out like, which, which group of people would be the best to take feedback from? Those who criticize you or those who like you? Say that again. Those like, that criticize you or those yeah. that like you? Um, so when you think about 360 degree feedback, uh, again, remember, your ball, you definitely want somebody who's your supervisor because they really have a, have a pretty clear perception of where you're moving. Um, you definitely want some peers. And in that peer group, it would probably be wise to have some people that, you know, were, let's say, more friendly and, and those that maybe weren't. Um, because again, you're trying to get this holistic look. And the way those, those 360s are developed, let's say I really don't like you. I mean, we just, you know, we had an argument a couple months ago and, you know, I just don't like you. Well, when I get a 360 on you, I can't, like, write in nasty comments. I have to fill out something on a scale and rate you. And there may be an area for a comment or two. But my point is the feedback would be filtered a bit, okay? And you usually are assigned to a coach who reviews all of the feedback and tries to filter and summarize it so that when I sit down with you, you know, you don't have one person who you had an argument with that's, you know, skewing all of the feedback. Uh, but again, you, you, you know, some of, our, some of your critics really are your best friends because they're the ones that illuminate those blind spots. Okay, you don't want a personal, there's a difference between being critical and somebody is making a personal attack. You know, if somebody's making a personal attack, that's, that's not what we're after. We're after somebody who can you know, who can really give you feedback, even if it's something, boy, you really got to improve. Okay, let me close there. Um, last point that I'll share with you is there's a lot of research um, done by a faculty member at Michigan State about what's going on in the talent market, and I think it's going to really impact you all. So we, we talked about how organizations are flattening, right? One of the things that's going to hit in the next 10 to 15 years is you've got a lot of baby boomers that are retiring. So for every two baby boomer positions at a senior level, guess how many they're going to fill? One. And you all are probably some of the people that will fill those roles. So congratulations, you're going to get some really cool roles that are like double the work. Okay? <laughs> now how are, how are you going to get it done? Well, here's what they're banking on. The person that just retired isn't nearly as good as, as, as you are with iPhone, iPad, social media, Twitter, you name it. So they're betting that you can leverage technology in a way that the, the generation that's retiring can't even fathom. So one of the secrets to your success needs to be figure out how to do that and do it well and get into that superior performance category 
leveraging technology so that you can handle that if, if you aspire to those kinds of roles. That's the opportunity that's out there. I hope this helped. Um, I've really enjoyed talking with you all. I sent you an email with, with all kinds of links and information, and I would really appreciate if you just pay me back and give me some feedback, what you liked, what you think I could do better. Um, and I just hope you have a great week here at Georgia State. We've enjoyed having you here today, and uh, I'll be around this week if you want to come find me. My business cards are in the back table. Okay? Thank you.